My name is Paul Shelley, and welcome to The Astro Historian. This is a channel dedicated to exploring and explaining the lore of sci-fi and space universes and discussing their impact. Today we'll be talking about the greatest humanitarian disaster of the modern UAE in Star Citizen, the Charon III Civil War, a conflict that will be decided by you in the future. Before we get started, I want to thank you all for your continued support. We have over 17,000 subscribers and rising. So if this is the second time you've watched one of my videos, make sure to hit that subscribe button and the bell icon to be notified when these are released. With that said, let's learn about the brutal conflict which still rages on the once prosperous world. Now this is the first time I'm gonna have to toss one of these out, but content warning for torture, death, genocide, and a whole lot of inhuman acts. To understand the conflict of Charon III, we're gonna to have to learn a little bit about the political power in the UEE today. The basic division of political power is the country or state. These are much like nations we have on Earth today, but often much larger. The Earth, for instance, is split into only a few major political states, and the same goes for most planets in the UEE. There are some exceptions to this rule, like that of Stanton, where the corporations of the system control the planets and will never gain representation in the government as a result. These nations are almost entirely independent, left on their own devices to pass what laws they see fit and enforce them how they like. The only limiting factor is their recognition of basic UEE common law. These are basic rights for all UEE citizens and include safety standards for structure and products, health services, basic education, access to an interplanetary trade and transport system, jump point and exploration management, and a security force which fights crime and external threats. As long as a state abides by these guidelines, they are free to govern as they see fit. The only other requirement is that of a governor to be chosen as a representative of the state in the planet. These governors act as representatives to the planet's governor's council, which acts as a planetary ruling body. This position is also the highest political position a civilian can attain. So most states are very independent, have a lot of control over local policies and laws, and even have representation in the planetary government. This also was the case with Charon III until the fall of the Mezers ripped the planet apart. Charon is a remote system that was discovered in 2538, but had little value and only a medium jump point to Helios and a small jump point to the Banu system of Kins. Thus, the planet of Charon III, the only world to be terraformed in the system, maintained an isolationist frontier culture. In 2628, Livia Mezer, aka Mezer III, approached the Senate for approval to build a special maximum security prison under the sole jurisdiction of the Imperator in the then rural state of Delon on Charon III. This was completed in 2630 and resulted in kickstarting the struggling economy of the fringe planet, causing the population to sharply rise. By the time Corson Mezer, Mezer V, rose to power in 2643, the once rural colony of Delon had become an urbanized center of commerce based around this prison. Corson met with the Governor's Council of Charon III in 2644 to make a deal, and afterwards ordered the construction of more facilities in Delon and its neighboring state, Acheron. The largest of these new prisons was known as Orville, and became the processing center for the new prison system on the planet, which would be named the Empire's Light Conversion Centers. During this time, the economy boomed, and by 2670, Corson made good on the deal he had brokered with the Council and officially sponsored Charon III, now known as Haros, to earn a Senate seat, giving the planet immense power in the central affairs of the UAE. Every passing Mezer regime became more and more brutal, and as such, life in these political prisons became worse and worse. These were political rabble-rousers or undesirables and were worked to death while waiting for hearings. By 2701, the prisons were ordered to execute any inmate who was too old to work in order to make room for younger ones. These brutal conditions were but rumors to the people of Haros, but as the military began testing bioweapons on the prisoners, the chemicals and radiation leached into the ground, making local growth of crops and food, which was difficult to begin with in the desert-like planet, nearly impossible. This caused the local population to rise up, only to be brutally suppressed by the UEE authorities. Thus, a seething hatred for the UEE festered in the population, especially those from Delon. When news of the last Mezer's death in 2792 reached the planet, the people stormed the prisons and liberated those who were still held inside. 
They arrested the guards that hadn't fled, they broke into offices, and recovered centuries of documents on the crimes against humanity perpetrated there. The already distrustful people of Haros were enraged by what had been going on right under their nose, and as the UE attempted to reform, with very little in the way of actual reformation of the system, the nations of Haros formally withdrew their membership to the UEE, being the first planet to ever have done so. This is when things went from bad to worse. Now independent, they were cut off economically from the support they enjoyed for centuries before, as the prisons had not only closed, but been demolished. The planet's soil had grown so bad, especially in Delon, that the country slipped into a famine. The ruling body of Delon appealed to their neighbors in the state of Acheron for aid, despite their situation being almost as dire. Nevertheless, a torrent of refugees flooded into Acheron from Delon, which was met with hostile aggression by the security forces of Acheron. By 2813, these border clashes between the two countries flared into full-blown war. The conflict was brutal, with many people in both nations having interests and families on the other. This was no mere border dispute anymore, as both sides accused the other of war crimes, as they battled for over five years. Finally, in 2819, a ceasefire was called. However, both sides have been fighting off and on for over a century, with the UEE attempting to mediate the conflict. As these wars continue, the infrastructure of both nations is constantly demolished and economic opportunity in general shrinks. With the planet poisoned by the Mezers, the agriculture of Charon III is sparse and not enough to support the population. These factors have led to the main professions in both states being laborers and soldiers. Thus, a cycle has begun where the best thing for both states when economic times get rough is to spark another conflict and get their people fighting or rebuilding. It also has caused deep divisions to form between the two warring states, where human rights violations are common, with both sides painting the other as monsters. While the 30th century was initially a fairly peaceful time in the conflict, recent issues have heightened the tension. In 2934, a devastating earthquake struck a Charon, and it was Delon who stepped forward to help their former enemy with aid. However, Acheron would go on to build a massive skyscraper out of the ruins of the buildings destroyed by the quake. To the people of Acheron, this was a symbol of perseverance and hope, but to the people of Delon, this was a symbol of arrogance, as they grew distrustful of their neighbors once more, as they wondered, why did Acheron need aid if they're able to build such a magnificent tower? Tensions would rise again, and war would continue. While eventually settling down, the latest issue that would spiral this conflict even worse was in 2944, when Tarquin Clast was elected governor of Delon. He proceeded to remove all checks and balances of Delon to give himself supreme power. Acheron accused him of being a tyrant and rigging the election, using it as an excuse to restart the war, one that continues to rage to this day. Later that year, a neutral transport named the Uana Gale took off from Delon and was intercepted by Acheron militia, who opened fire on it. While the transport was able to fight off and destroy the attackers, the transport was crippled. A UEE battle group that had been stationed near the planet to monitor the conflict sent a rescue team to the transport, but were contacted by a Charon officials who warned them away, saying it was still in their jurisdiction and that the transport was full of Delon war criminals who had attempted genocide during the recent conflict. The Senate was called into an emergency meeting to decide on what to do, but they had pledged to stay out of the conflict and had far too much to deal with in places like Nexus and on the border of the Van Duel. By the time they began to discuss the options, it was too late. The Charon forces had returned and destroyed the transport, killing all on board. The UEE has attempted to mediate this new conflict, but as war with the Van Duel kicked off in 2946, most of the UEE military forces mitigating this conflict were pulled away to the front. By 2948, humanitarian groups were struggling to keep aid coming in. One group, based out of Terra, known as Empires Overlooked, has established connections in both states, and is trying to stop the conflict by buying goods directly from the people to keep them employed. Their hope is that by getting these people out of the war cycle, they may be able to get them unhooked from the war economy. To get the goods in and out, they hire independent haulers. However, since the UEE Navy has left, this has become a major issue. Now, both sides of the conflict have accused the other of using aid shipments as cover for weapons. Anything that enters the atmosphere is now being shot on sight, especially independent haulers. To this end, Empires Overlooked partnered with Crusader Industries to bring larger shipments into the planet through a project they called Operation Sword of Hope. Based out of an old Navy base and Tangora called Camp Murdoch, 
Both groups used the airfield as a staging post to load up Hercules' Starlifters with everything from aid supplies to Nova tanks. They would then transit to Charon, often where they'd be met by Achiron fighters, who would then be engaged by escorts. The initial landings of these supplies required A-2s to bomb an ancient airfield in the deserts of Delin on the border of Acheron. There they send caravans guarded by combat vehicles to nearby villages to swap supplies. This conflict still rages on, with Acheron becoming more aggressive and Delin becoming more authoritarian. With the UEE unable to intercede, groups like Crusader and EEO are trying to bring an end to the conflict. But in truth, the only people who will bring an end to this generational civil war are the players. This is one of the many purposeful plot points which players will play a role in deciding. So it may be you who figures out how to bring peace to Charon 3, once and for all, for good or for ill. I'd like to thank you for watching. I'd also like to thank those Patreons on screen now, whom without their help none of this would be possible. If you want to join them, the link is in the description. For as little as $5 a month, you get early access to videos, including a timed exclusive covering the entire history of the Star Citizen universe, whose first two episodes have been released to the public. Check them out now to see what $5 a month will get you. For now, let me know what you think about the Charon 3 conflict in the comments below. And as always, remember, Exhistoria at Astra.